Silk macaques take their name from the unique hairdos that each of them wear. These hairstyles are determined at birth and are so unique that they serve as a distinct identification for each individual, much like fingerprints define each human being. Dr. Wolfgang Dieters, a primatologist, has been studying the species here in Polonarowa for over 30 years. Since his arrival, he's revolutionized the way we think about monkey society. He's opened up a world where family ties and friendships can make the difference between survival and death. We joined Dr. Wolf at his base on the outskirts of the city. Today he's got a new recruit on his hands. Felicia's come all the way from the island of Singapore to learn about his research and get some unique field experience. Dr. Wolf provides a golden opportunity for aspiring young conservationists, offering them the chance to help him in his research. We can fix up some of the watch the thorns here. The first priority is to get acquainted with the various family groups in the study area. Initially when I began to work here I just gave them, you know, random A, B, C, D, E. But then what happens through time, sometimes the group splits up. Then we have a, an M1 segment and an M2 segment and an M3 segment. That's how we get these odd labels that you're seeing. The macaques are not the only primates living in the forests and temple ruins of Polonarowa. They share the habitat with grey langurs a much larger species of monkey, which also has very strong family bonds. The two species are able to coexist because the langurs are specialist leaf eaters and not as versatile in their diets as the macaques. Although the species do come into contact with each other, it's the smaller macaques that are dominant over the langurs. What they lack in size, they make up for in feisty temperaments. <laughs> focus on that shot long enough, uh, you might be able to see the strokes of cacks supplanting the grey langur from its feeding spot. See the little infant macaques right behind the langur? That infant might chase the langur off. They might. They might not. That's a common feature in these uh, interspecific relationships. Uh, the macaques are ecologically dominant through the grey langurs. When they're in the mood, macaques can make real nuisances of themselves, making threats and mock charges against outsiders. Until finally, the langurs just have enough of it and retreat out of harm's way. In fact, there are two species of langur resident here, and the far more reclusive purple-faced leaf monkey is even less forthcoming than the grey langurs, it sticks around just long enough to grab a quick meal and then disappears once more into the foliage. Oh, it's like a solitary male langur out here, along with the macaques. He's probably been thrown out or he's trying to make his way into another langur group. But despite their more passive nature, teamwork still pays off for the langurs. They use the roads around Polonarowa as shortcuts to the best feeding places, which invariably means someone's backyard. Grey langurs are always more numerous than the macaques because the langurs' diet depends on leaves. There are more leaves in the forest than there are fruit, so always, in most situations, there are more, more langurs than there are macaques. Although raiding food from urban areas seems initially like a good idea, this is when problems start to happen. <laughs> Access to human garbage has a dramatic effect on the monkey's feeding behavior. These days, plastic bags are as much on the menu as shoots and seeds, and sites like this have become commonplace. 
It's a growing concern to the doctor and his team because this increased exposure to the worst that human society has to offer is having serious consequences on the lives of the troops. Now you'd think having your study animals living right on your doorstep would make it a little bit easier to raise awareness about them. But unfortunately these tote macaques, despite their uniqueness, have a very poor reputation with the locals. And Dr. Wolf is facing an uphill struggle to try and change that. It's a threat to their survival in the sense that you're artificially, in, you're artificially feeding them. I mean, people don't think of it that way, but that's in effect what's happening. And that then stimulates population growth. In other words, more monkeys survive, more monkeys are born. And to the point where there are more monkeys in the area than the natural food resources can support. And so when the tourists aren't around, then the monkeys go into neighboring uh, villages and they begin to raid. And then people get angry with them and they poison them or they you know, trap them and do some other nasty things. So the end effect of this seemingly kind act of giving food to monkeys is actually uh, have very it's just like yeah, drastic consequences. So how do you go about solving this problem? Well, top on the list of priorities is the need to raise awareness. But to do that, you've got to understand the animal you're trying to conserve. Dr. Wolf is doing just that by using a variety of field techniques to get into the mind of the tote macaque.